I'd also like to thank the organisers for absolute impeccable timing. Um, the results are coming in through the election. I have refreshed my phone every two seconds. I've run out of battery. So this is the perfect time for me to step away, step away from the stress and have a calmer time by giving you a talk about science. Um, okay, so I actually have no disclosures on this path to work, um, unfortunately. Um, but I, I want to start off with this slide. I, I obnoxiously so, showed the slide a lot. But this is the current list of probes that we have at MSK, and I think it's interesting that um, you, know, you know, we obviously have a lot of fluorine-based small molecules we put into patients. Um, the peptide you heard from Marion the other day about JR11, the fact we're doing the gam 6 j lutetium study there, we're doing RM2 that you heard a little bit about. Um, there is this whole other group of agents, antibodies, which have been used in the theragnostic paradigm we heard from Rich earlier for quite some time, whether it be imaging and or therapy. And antibodies are superb, but they suffer from a lot of disadvantages, even though they're absolutely exquisitely uh, sensitive or, very, or, or for their targets. Um, but what we want to try and do is use some of these platforms, overcome the limitations, and use them in a different way. And so that's what I'm going to talk a bit about today. And, and the reason is this. This is a prime example of something we've done. This is Yelena Janjigian, who's a medical oncologist, and Narissa, who is a postdoc in my lab and now an assistant professor over in Michigan. Um, Yelena had an interesting... Um, question for us. A third of her patients um, have gastric cancer. Um, sorry, all of her patients have gastric cancer, a third of which are HER2 positive. But she doesn't know which third these are unless they're getting a biopsy. So we did something very simple. We took a septin, we labeled it with zirconium 89, we put it into her patients, and we looked at her lesions to show which ones are HER2 positive. So identify that third of these patients. This is a man, and we're looking at his HER2 status in his gastric cancer. What's interesting, this is just the excretion of zirconium. What's interesting is the fact you can see there's three masses here and there's heterogeneity. These patients also happen to get a fitnib as their therapy. Downstream effect of a fitnib working is the downregulation of HER2. So if a fitnib is going to work in a particular cancer, you should see your HER2 signal drop in a follow-up scan. This is a gentleman's follow-up scan. You can see here that this lesion here did not respond to a fitnib. This one completely responded to a fitnib, and which part of the tumor here you look at says one part of it responded, one part didn't. And I think it's a very elegant way of showing that this drug has worked here, but it hasn't worked here. So this patient may want a different kind of therapy, and this is just by a five-day follow-up of the image. However, this works beautifully. Yelena can tell, first of all, which patients um, to give her septin to as part of the treatment paradigm, but also which patients she has to really think about doing something different with if they're not responding to a fitnib. In this case, this gentleman is having a mixed response. But we inject the zirconium perceptin, and then we have to wait five days for this image. And that's the disadvantage. It's okay in New York. We have taxis. We can easily get everywhere. But if you're living in Indiana, it, it doesn't really work that way. So we really need to find a way of using these antibodies, like, like a septin, in a much better and faster way so we don't have this five-day wait. And the peptides and PSMA, I think, are the prime example of this. But I don't want us to forget we do have advantages of antibodies. So can we take advantage of an antibody system but use in a pre-targeting manner the pharmacodynamics of a small molecule to image an antibody? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I do need to start off with some acknowledgements here. This isn't the end of the slide, so I can get back to the election. This is actually um, three guys. So um, Brian was a postdoc in my lab that started this. He's now assistant professor at Hunter. Jake then did some of the work on the pancreatic work. Um, he actually started last week as an assistant professor at Vanderbilt. And JP um, is still a postdoc in my lab, and I have no idea what he's going to do yet. But um, these guys really kind of uh, led a lot of this work. Um, and they all had their own individual NIH funding to do this. So um, the basics is click chemistry. I know there's a lot of people in here that, that are physicians, but um, I mean, Paul's talk this morning was phenomenal. It's nice to see some chemistry. Um, and the whole concept of click chemistry is the fact this is a very fast reaction. You're taking basically two pieces of jigsaw, and they attach to each other, but they're incredibly selective. They only attach to each other. It's very clean. It's very high yield. And most importantly, it's bi-orthogonal, that this reaction happens in biology. But it, nothing, they don't react with anything else in biology. So you can have these two systems and a living system, and they only react with each other and nothing else. And it all started off many years ago with this 3-2 cycle addition reaction. That required, as you can see here, copper catalyst. We can't be injecting patients with copper in order to make this happen. But now we've moved on to a different kind of reaction. And this is taking um, these two entities, uh, norbornene tetracine. They react extremely fast with each other and create this entity. And that's about as chemistry as I'm going to get for you. But what's important to po point out is no catalyst. 
and it's a very, very fast reaction. This means nothing much, I'm not sure to the, the, the clinicians here, but that's a pretty fast thing. Um, and you can buy these entities. So we have our problem. We have things that react with each other. Now how do we do this in the biological system? Now pre-targeting has been around for a long time. David Colton, his work, absolutely phenomenal. Um, there, it, there were limitations through um, immunoactivity and everything else, but this is what the basic concept is. It's taking our antibody with the first path to click molecule in, injecting it, and just letting it do its stuff. So this would float around the body for three, four days, do the accumulation, have its uptake in its target, and wash out of its non-target. Non-radioactive, it could be done during a regular hospital visit. And then, once you've got that slow clearance, the antibody, which is a disadvantage of antibodies, but you've allowed that to happen, then come in with a very small molecule that that time is labeled with a PET or a, or a therapeutic nuclide, inject that, and then these two things miraculously find each other in situ in the tumor in the living system, and they react, and then you have the labeling of your antibody. And the concept is this. We want to put in the antibody, let it do its thing, then we inject in the small molecule diagnostic. We then visualize and quantitate how much antibody or target there is in the antibody, in the tumor, and then if there's enough antibody left, which there should be, we can then follow with a small molecule therapeutic. So it's a single antibody, but when we're following and chasing in with a diagnostic and then a therapeutic using the, the antibody. So I can't spend too much about the antibodies, but you know, A33 is well known in Australia especially. This is, um, a tight junction protein that we have, there's an antibody for that the groups here have done most remarkably um, superb work on. Um, Andrew Scott has, has led much of this. This is an antibody that's used for colorectal cancer, and colorectal is important here. Um, and the other antibody I'm going to talk on about is an antibody called 5B1, which we use um, for imaging pancreatic cancer. Um, this attaches to CA99, which is secreted by a marker from pancreatic cancer, just as PSA comes out of prostate cancer, CA99 comes out of pancreatic cancer. And we have a human antibody, not humanized human, actually came from one of our patients. We isolated it from a patient, and we used um, her antibody um, to do this. And we did, we're doing zirconium-89 5B1 imaging in humans right now, and it looks phenomenal. But we still have this limitation of the time. So we have these two antibodies. The absolute important thing to note with pre-targeting is the fact these antibodies have to not be internalized or very slowly internalized. You won't be able to pre-target with Herceptin because it gets internalized too good, but there is this, this family of antibodies, particularly those looking at secreted biomarkers, which, which are circulating and stay in the, in the intracellular milieu of the tumor. So what we have to do is first of all take the antibody and make sure that when, we, when these two things react with each other in a test tube, what kind of image we're getting. And so we had first of all this copper species um, that we wanted to see with the TCO and this tetrazine, what this looked like in mice. And it was actually better than we expected, but you know, you're still getting to 48 hours, this is the mouse here, before you can really delineate very nicely the tumor um, over everything else with all the, the blood here that still needs to be cleared out. So this is what happens when you do it in a test tube and inject it. Can it happen in a mouse? Well, oh, sorry, and this is the regular, that's the distribution of that study, just pre-labeling the antibody as a single construct, then injecting, and you see about 20% ID per gram, but background here, um, especially in the quantification, obviously shows that there's a disadvantage here. But then we want to do this in animals, and we have to inject the antibody, and then we have to follow, after a length of time, the small molecule. But what do we do? What nuclide do we use? How much antibody do we inject? And then how much more molecule do we inject? And how much lag time do we wait between the, the injection of the antibody and then the small molecule? So as Brian beautifully put it, we're taking cookie dough and making cookies. I prefer the cookie dough. Um, but now we have big warnings and our cookie dough packages cannot re eat raw cookie dough. So apparently we have to stick with the cookies. Um, so the first experiment was this. Doing animals, taking a colorectal cancer xenograph, injecting the antibody with the TCO. So it's not radio labeled, it has a TCO on there. Right now we're just doing regular conjugation of antibodies, but we now do this through a site-specific method, and I don't have time to talk about that today. We then wait for 24 hours for it hit the tumor and then hopefully un unattached antibody then leaves, and then inject the small molecule copper 64 no to tetrazine. And this is what we saw at two hours. There's the tumor, and then there's clearance. At six hours, we got the tumor, and then at 12 hours, we got a better uptake, probably equivalent to the 48-hour image we would get by injecting it already pre-labeled. But here's the issue. We're going here through the gut. This is looking at colorectal cancer. We couldn't have a worse distribution for this molecule because it's going through the gut. So we then decided, hang on a minute, oh, and then we looked at the biodistribution. 
We had modest tumor uptake, but we really were suffering from this intestine and, and, and intestinal uptake, which is going to be useless for a copper 64 uh, for a colorectal cancer. So then we realized, oh, wait, we're chemists. We can do stuff like this. We can, we can change the compound. And we've known for a long time that you can fundamentally change the pharmacokinetics of a chelate of a small molecule by changing the charge. And we were using, in this case, NOTA, which had a negative charge. But we also knew that if we go to positive charges, we're more likely to put this through the kidneys than through the liver. And you heard a phenomenal talk by Paul this morning talking about copper SAR. -R. And um, so we decided, because of positive charge, could we use this? Could we use this instead of the NOTA? still have the reaction happen in tumors, but drive, if it doesn't react, drive the small molecule through the kidneys and not through the intestines. So um, did the chemistry, I'm not gonna go through this, but there's, there's, there's that superb chelate that Paul talked about this morning, and then we put the tetracine on. And this is the compound that we have used. So this is the second generation system, same experiment, taking A33 TCO injecting into tumors, waiting 24 hours for it to accumulate and the background to clear, and then injecting copper 64 tetracine SAR R. This was our images at four hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And you can see that even at, this is the MIPS, I do think those people show images, we have to show the whole body because it gives a better impression. But at 12 hours, we're getting really a phenomenal antibody image. This, this copper 64 tetracine is reacting with it, the antibody in the tumor and developing image. If you don't have the antibody present, it just goes straight through the kidneys. You don't see any tumor accumulation at all. So we've now seen um, a pretty good image at 12 hours with a copper SAR. -R. Um, we do suffer from a reduction in the overall tumor uptake, but our clearance is far superior. So our background, so imaging is all about ratio of uptake in the tumor to the background. And I think this shows very nicely that even though we've fundamentally reduced our overall tumor uptake, the background has, has dropped, and as you can see, we're driving through the kidney. So if we're going to image colorectal cancer, that's a good thing. And there's the tumor, and then the intestinal uptake obviously significantly reduced. We've driven the compound through the kidney. So um, we also decided, can we, what happens if we waited more than 24 hours between the antibody and the small molecule? Exactly equivalent images at 48 or 120 hours. We don't want to have a system where the patient has to come in, get the antibody, and said, okay, exactly at 24 hours, you have to come in and get this small molecule. People have lives. They have to work around families and children. And we found it doesn't make any difference if you do it 24 hours or 172 hours, the image quality is pretty much the same. So you have that flexibility of scheduling your patient when you do this. So the most important aspect of this is the fact we're doing zirconium antibodies. We have five in humans right now. Dosimetry is an issue, but it's, uh, the FDA doesn't really worry about it, but we always want to do whatever we can to lower the dosimetry. Um, when we look at the effective dose, there's a horrible table, but if we look at the, an, the effective dose of zirconium DFO, A33, 1.5 mems per millicurie, sorry, I can't do it in megabex, um, but if we look at the, say, let's take the 120-hour gap between the antibody and the small molecule, the reduction dose was of 1.5 down to 0 0.03. It's a significant reduction in the amount of dose this patient's going to have, and you can get the image on the same day. We actually are now taking this into humans. The copper SAR R, or, or one of the, one of the uh, subtle change analogs, we had almost done the GLP study. We have the A33, and we're hoping we're going to be doing this probably first quarter next year to see if this really does work in humans. But then also, we have this, this, this complex, and we're now re getting images at one hour, two hours, and four hours, um, post-injection of the small molecule. So why can't we start using short-lived isotopes? We're using copper 64, and we absolutely, I think it's valid to do this in humans because we want to make sure the time scale's right. But if in humans we're showing it's going to be in a couple of hours post-injection, the copper 64 is going to be overkill. We, need, we, can go, we can go shorter. So now we started with our 5B1 antibody. This is the one that hits the pancreatic cancer image. And um, we started off by making sure with the copper that the images we got. This is a, um, an organoid pancreatic cancer, we're moving away from subcutaneous tumors. They're, they're, anybody can do that. We want organoids, which actually are real tumors, orthotopically implanted into the pancreas of a mouse. Um, 5B1 looks extremely well, good in a mouse picking out the pancreatic cancer. Um, so JP came along, and he just started with one compound, and this was the ALF version of this tetrazine, injected, in this case, the 5B1 TCO, waited 72 hours, and then um, injected this small molecule to see what he could see. And after one hour, this is the tumor here. So after one hour, we were able to visualize very nicely 
the pancreatic tumor as where the antibody has been delineated. And most importantly, it was compared with, say, the zirconium, which we are doing in humans. There was a 67-fold reduction in effective dose, but we were able to get the PET image one hour post-injection of the rate of pharmaceutical. This was the first one he tried, and I'm like, ah, oh, you know, we've got to try other analogs. So he did that. He realized, again, we're chemists. We can change things, like the tetrazine. What if we have a slightly more stable tetrazine? Could we improve things? What if we change the linker? What if we changed um, lysines and actually changed the charge on the linker in order to improve or increase or decrease the circulation time of this small molecule, thereby improving tumor uptake? And what happens if we start playing around with chelates? Again, the charge. Can we drive it through different stuff? So in his first, this was the first series of compounds he made, and then he did these, and then he did these, and then he did these. And that was his first week in the lab, and then I said to him, you know, you really need to get back down to doing some serious work. Um, but he, he, this was the series, I mean, he really got carried away, but this was the structure activity relationship series. Don't even think about doing this, but he did all this, all the measurements. He really, he looked at this in animal studies and with biodistribution and imaging and seeing how these small molecules all behave and, and how these structure activity relationships. I don't know if many people know, I did my PhD with Phil Blower and um, the, the phrase methyl, ethyl, butyl, futile kept coming out in our group meetings when I came there. That kind of um, took me back to the, my training with Phil. But yeah, so there was a little methyl, ethyl, butyl, futile here. Um, I'm just gonna show a bit of the data. And that is the fact that even with the F18 analogs, if you change the charge on the F18 analogs, that you can change the, the somewhat the half-life, but you can also change it driving through the kidneys, again, based on charge compared with the neutral. So we had the ability also with F18 agents to do this. That really, when you think about it, we used to do this with copper or um, UTC or metal chelates all the time, changing this charge. We had the ability to do it with fluoride as well, fluoride agents. Um, when we look at, in a, in a tumor system, when we look at the gallium, some of the gallium agents, we found that the increased blood life increases tumor uptake, which was, you know, somewhat um, not surprising, but we saw that, you know, by changing charge, it didn't change, it changed the distribution much, but it didn't change the overall tumor uptake. And then after all that came, we really came up with um, somewhat we're calling our lead compound now, um, which we're calling JM, well, it's JP Meyer, so he called himself JM044. And this compound at two hours, this is the tumor. This is when we're able to inject the antibody um, with the TCO on, come back 72 hours later, inject this small molecule, and then after um, a, a two hour image, this is the imaging in the tumor. Um, we still do have some of this background. Now, this isn't my last slide, but I do think it's important to note that even this, I think Clarity would be really happy. We haven't quite beaten the tetracine SAR yet. But what we have found is that, you know, with this series of compounds and fluorine 18 and gallium and, and everything else, we can change molecular charge to affect biodistribution significantly. That, that we can drive it to different organs. We can change positive charge um, uh, uh, to, to drive clearance through the kidneys. Um, don't get too positive on your charge. Otherwise, you get such a ha short half-life. It gets excreted out so quickly, you don't have tumor uptake. So this, I think, has been a really important, interesting study. But this meeting is also about not just the Gnostics, it's about the third Gnostics. So um, we also want to use this for pre-targeting radioimmunotherapy. We're sending in this antibody into the tumor, and we have numerous of these groups available on the group, and we're putting in high specific activity small molecule. So we, can, we already know through the diagnostic side, we can inject the fluorine compound, wait a day, inject the fluorine compound again, and we still see as much tumor uptake because there's still available clickable groups in the tumor. We know we can come back the third day and do it again. So this tumor is still in situ, and it's still over all these different times able to attach more of that. So why don't we just take the antibody, inject the diagnostic, see how much goes to the tumor. If there's no uptake in the tumor, don't get any further. If there is, then we just inject, inject the T-spin small molecule. This is what we're doing now, um, and instead of the copper SAR, we're us using the TSIM version of this. We actually just got the acceptance um, in the ACR MCT just yesterday, um, and I've only just made one slide because I didn't have a chance to do it until it's accepted. Um, but this is the first results for that, and this quite simply is, this is just a single injection, but we've been repeating, you inject the antibody, and then you come in with different levels of lutetium. And I think what's important to note is this is the control, um, in these pancreatic tumors. Then we start giving um, uh, just the antibody, because we want to make sure that this is used as an ADC construct, that there's no therapeutic effect from the antibody. Then we start giving the, the different groups of 
Uh, with TCM, you can see at 400 microcuries, we're getting a good bit of melting of the tumors. When we get to 800 microcuries, we're getting um, really good responses. When we got to 1,200 in a very aggressive, aggressive pancreatic cancer model, we flatlined the tumor growth and they've disappeared. Um, what we're able to do in some of these groups now is, um, even though we haven't seen any toxicity here, we, we're, we're now taking this kind of group and coming in with repeat injection of lutetium. And we can confirm by the imaging that each time we inject, we are still hitting the tumor until we do saturate those sites. So this is where we're kind of going with that. This is clinically at least a good year away. Um, the, the diagnostic side is going to be our soon. But I do think that when we're talking about theragnostics, we always think gallium lutetium and some of the others. But the, you know, in, in this kind of paradigm, we can use fluorine as part of the theragnostic. Um, and using the platform of the antibody as the target. So um, I get to come here and watch the election. It's the current group that do the work um, and my, the rest of my group. <laughs> um, but really, I do need to thank um, funding sources and their collaborators for, for doing this. And thank you very much for your attention. Very nice talk. Very interesting uh, results on that, uh, the development of those spacers, linkers, and... Yeah. Getting, getting it all together, it's really very really yeah, impressive. Changing light scenes, yeah. just even the backbone had such a fundamental difference of distribution, it's fascinating. <laughs> What's happening when, 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 the, when they link? Have you looked at anything on a microdosimetry level where the, you know, the antibodies are sitting on actually at the rim or where are they? And, and what happens once the click chemistry happens? There's any other transfer of radionuclide closer into the tumor? No, so the A33, um, as far as we know, isn't that internalized that much and it stays in the junction. So if we're gonna use a therapy, we have to use the, something that's gonna not have to be nuclear um, localized. Um, with the 5B1, it is actually slowly internalized. Um, we've just started now doing the actinium-225 pre-targeting therapy study with it. Because I think that, especially if these are secreted by markets, actually it might be exactly where we need to be because it just kicks the crap out of everything. Sorry. <laughs> so I think that might be the best way for us to it, do it. It would be nice if when it clicks, it internalizes the antibody. That we Figure have that talked out. about. Like, what if you also click on a tat or something like that right, and right. after the fact and then make it driven in there? You, yeah. Because we actually, so we have the site specific mode now where we can actually put four clickable groups on every antibody. And we, could put, we have this other soon to be human study where we have a dye on, on there. And, and zirconium um, 5B1 so we can inject into the patient, do the PET scan, patient goes off to surgery, and then from that same, in, that, that, only that one injection of antibody, the dye is on there that the surgeon can then actually pick out hot nodes that they're looking at the PET scan and then go in and use the fluorescence mark on the same probe. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we can start decorating. We, we're, you know, chemists, we love decorating stuff and adding more stuff on. We need to keep things simple. And that's, I do worry when we do that, we're going to get too complicated, which the pre-targeting paradigm has suffered from, I think, in the past. No, but the idea of uh, actually injecting antibody once, doing an image, then, then following it with a fluorescent probe prior to surgery is a really... Oh, we've done that. Way. We actually do it, the same antibody, just having the, the, the fluorescent probe already on the antibody, as well as the, as well as the, the chelate with the zirconium. That's what we're actually doing. We're not even following up. We're just starting off, sorry, by doing the old somewhat fashion way, but then going with the dye. Oh, oh, we have... Oh, um, these lights are really so bright up here. I hear very, a voice over here somewhere. Very nice uh, talk. Can you elaborate a little bit regarding the tetrazine te TCO pair? Is almost everything that's in the literature, including what you presented, the tetrazine is where you have, it's attached to the chelator and the TCO is on the, mo the monoclonal antibody. You could conceivably switch those. You, you can switch them, but on the other way around, the, the other one's less stable. So the reason why we've done it that way is that the entity that goes on the antibody is more stable in the biological system. The other one degrades more in the biological system. So that's why we have it in that particular order. There's a phenomenal work that came out of Ralph Weisleiders where they've looked at many different tetrazine um, norborneine pairs. And so there are faster reactions, faster pairs that react faster, but they have lower in, in vivo uh, stability. So we're really trying to balance the stability of of what we're putting into the biological system with the speed of the reaction. And that, that's kind of the best pair we have now. But no, doing it the way around, we suffer the fact that it, it degrades in biological systems yeah, over and, a long time. And probably the other thing is I love the comment about being, you know, being a fellow chemist. You want to keep it simple. You want to get it approved. Simple, yeah. uh, one of the issues is to get to a theragnostics. You need to get the, pep, uh, the, the monoclonal antibody approved. The, uh, and then you've got to get the... Uh, 
the, uh, the, for the, uh, the diagnostic proofs, and you can get the, ther the theranostic proofs. So you, you have to get three approvals well, versus. Well, that, that is, well, yes and no. The reason why we used A33 and we used 5B1 is A33 is being put extensively in humans as an ionated antibody, and that's been studied. The 5B1 is now in humans as a zirconium 5B1 study, and it's also been used as an ADC in much larger amounts than we're using for the diagnostic sites. So we did little antibodies where the FDA, we can say, this has already gone into humans, you know, like Herceptin. You know, we don't have to do a tox package for Herceptin. It's just a small molecule we have to worry about. Going into the patients next year, we went to the FDA, and they said, what do you expect to see? Do you want to see the tox package of the small molecule or the antibody? or the mixture of both. And they actually kind of, we said, we only want to do the small molecule, and they're like, that's fine. They may come back and say after the fact, oh, now we need to see the click product. And we actually did do one co cohort of animals where we clicked it in the test tube and then put it in. But they seem, I mean, just getting on a small molecule is such a lower hurdle. Now, this is for INDs, you know, approval for an FDA-approved drug might be, might be a bigger hurdle. But yeah, that's absolutely a, an, an, a uh, we wouldn't do this with a brand new antibody that's never been in a human because of exactly what you said. OK, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there another question back there? Yeah, only a small question. Is there any pH, uh, pH dependency on the click reaction in vivo? In vivo, no. Um, well, it works with physiological pH. I can't tell you. You know, I've often thought about especially the intracellular, or sorry, the extracellular pH that's right on the surface of a cell and how that could be more acidic. We actually have peptides that look at acidity. Um, and we're trying to measure that at the same time using P31 spectroscopy, seeing if there is a difference of pH levels. But we haven't seen it in a test tube, and I'm not sure we'll see that difference in a... In a there is going to be some sensitivity, but not the levels we're, we're probably seeing in, in the tumor at this point. It's the first follow-up. One more question. Uh, two questions here. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> um, so uh, one is that um, this is a very nice antibody-antigen interaction. So I wonder if you have tried to look at the receptor ligand interaction. If not, what do you think is going to happen? So that's the first question. The second one is that I saw you had a, a series of uh, compounds, and some of them, some of the chasers, is a little bit high in the blood, uh, lingering around. So that's probably not desirable, but uh, I was wondering whether it's actually better for the tumor uh, intensity. Yeah, so with, I think with the gallium agents, we, we showed that. We, we, of course, want to try and get it through the kidneys, out the blood as quickly as possible. But what we found out was we, we got too fast. And it went out before it happened to tumor. So it's a balance again. So balance of, that's why we added some pegs in there, because we wanted to make sure it actually had enough time circulated blood half-life in order to do the reaction, and it wasn't too fast that it, it came out. Um, I wasn't quite sure I understood what the first question was. The first one is that, have you tried to look at the receptor ligand interaction, which has a, like, like a nanomolar affinity? It's oh, so like like there, especially for the 5B1, for the CA99, it has an incredibly high um, affinity. It's in the paper. I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's one of the highest we've seen for the antibody. They're very high. A33, I can tell you what it is, actually, yeah, the 5B1. Yeah, but uh, have you tried to look at the receptor ligand, which has usually nanomolar affinity? Oh, no, no. What no. do you think is going to happen? I'm still not quite sure what you mean. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, because being a bit uh, dental I think jet that you are, you are relying on the antibody yes. staying on the tumor for a long time. And what if uh, it's a ligand that doesn't stay on the receptor for too long? So when you wait, Oh, you're talking about the K-on, K-off kind of thing? How long is it floating? Yeah. Oh, no, it's there for a long time. I mean, it's also, especially with the C99, it's a secreted antigen. So you're constantly having um, the antigen, the CA99, being secreted constantly by the tumor. It does get washed through the, through the blood, but you always have that co higher concentration level in present in the tumor. Okay. Thank you. We can catch them catch later. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.